This video is going to introduce the basic predicate logic proof method that you can use for relatively simple predicate logic proofs. Namely, cases where all the quantifiers are in the front of the formula, and all you have to do is get rid of them to get at the propositional structure underneath. So let's jump in. Our goal is to get rid of the quantifiers. And so, as it says here, the first step is to assume the opposite of the conclusion if it's quantified. Well, we have a quantifier, so it's quantified. To assume the opposite, we're going to use tilde out, and for that, we will need a box, and I happen to have a box of exactly the right size sitting off to the side. All right, now, having made the box, we know that the first line is going to be a PA, and this is for tilde out, of course. And to assume the opposite of a quantified formula, all you have to do is add a tilde in front of it. No parentheses or anything else. So tilde for all x, rx. Down at the bottom, we'll be looking for a contradiction, so we'll put the contradiction symbol down there. Now, we go up to the top and we're going to work through all these formulas and get rid of the quantifiers. First of all, if you have two tildes in front of a quantifier like we see on line two, you've got to do double negation. And so, of course, that's what we'll do. This is trivial. We get there is an x, sx, ampersand, tx. And that would be two double negation. OK. We should check off the lines as we work on them. Once you've worked on one of these quantified lines, you're not going to need to, to go back to it. Now, quantifier exchange. Well, any case, like line number one and line number five, where you have a tilde in front of the quantifier, you need to do quantifier exchange to get the tilde out of the way. Let's work on number one first. When we work on it, all that's going to change is the tilde and the quantifier. And so we switch to the opposite quantifier, and then we move the tilde to the other side. And then the rest of the formula is what counts as the p part. If you look over here at the rule, you can see that the only thing that changes is that you're switching to the other quantifier and you're moving the tilde to the other side of the quantifier. All right, so this tilde right here, this is part of the px part. And that's why I'm going to end up with two tildes right here, sx arrow rx. And that will be one quantifier exchange, QE. Check it off. Now I need to do the same thing on five. And so let me just put a check there and say that on line eight, I'm going to switch to an existential, move the tilde to the other side, bring down the rx portion, 5 qe. OK, we've done all the quantifier exchanges that need to be done. We're now up to existential out. We know that when you're doing existential out, it has to be a new name, one that does not appear anywhere in the proof, including the conclusion. All right, so where do we need to do existential out? When you look at this, we've actually got three formulas, one, two, three, that all have existentials as their main connectives, so we should work on each one of them. Strictly speaking, the order doesn't matter, but then you might as well work top to bottom. So if I work on line three, I drop the quantifier, I rewrite the rest of the formula, replace the variable x with a name. What name should I choose? Well, notice there are no names in this proof right now x is a variable, not a name, and the capital letters s, r, t, w, z, etc., those, of course, are predicates. The names are the lowercase letters a through w, and so there's no names in here. I'm going to go ahead and choose a and call that three existential out and check it off. Basically, this formula says there's at least one thing that has the W property. And what we're saying is, well, let's call that thing Albert just so that we can talk about it. All right, uh, now we need to work on 6. So line number 10 is going to be S something or other, ampersand T something or other. Well, what name do we choose? 
it can't be Albert because we don't know if the same thing that has the S and the T property is the same as the one that has the W property. So we need to use a different name. I think you should be boring and choose names alphabetically, so let's choose B. Notice it would be a serious mistake if you put B there and C here, because we are saying that there is one thing, at least one thing, that has both of these name that has both of these properties, and so we do want to put in the same name there. That'd be six existential out. Always one quantifier gives you one name. Check it off. Okay, now you know the story. Now we're going to work on number eight. And again, we have to choose a new name. So this time, let's go with tilde R, C. And that would be eight existential out. At this point, we've completed all the existentials. The only thing that involves quantifiers that should be left are the universals. And we see that we have two of them on lines four and seven. Again, it doesn't matter which one I work on. I might as well go ahead and start with number four first, and I'm going to drop the quantifier, rewrite the rest of the formula, and replace the variable with a name. I might notice that there's a pre-manufactured contradiction here on the back end. Now, what name am I going to put in there with my sloppy handwriting? So when you're choosing a name, what you want to do is look around and see what are the predicates already connected with. And when I look here, I see, well, I've got a W and a Z and an N. Z and N are not matched up with anything up above, but W is obviously matched up with A, and so A looks like the right choice. It can get tricky sometimes, but in general, it's this simple. Take a look and see what the predicates are matched up with above and choose that name. Because notice if you look over here, it says for universal out, A can be any name whatsoever. But in practice, it's very important that you choose a name that's going to get the proof finished. And so you can see if we choose WA, then that's going to allow us to set up the arrow out. Uh, what I just did would be for universal out. Now at this point I could actually finish this proof because I can say well let's do wedge in and get ZA and then we'll get the contradiction and we'll be done. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. In fact if I now work on line 7 this is going to be an extraneous line. I will occasionally put extraneous lines in arguments at this point because it's one of the better ways to kind of keep you on your toes. If you notice that the lines are extraneous, you don't have to work on them. Uh, it turns out in this particular case, both lines in one and two up here were totally extraneous. But I did this in part so that you, you have the challenge that I want to illustrate right now. Let's say that I decide I do want to work on seven. So on line 13, I say, let me work on this and get tilde tilde S something or other arrow R something or other. Well, now the question is, what name do I want to put in here? And so I took a, take a look around and I see that S is matched up with the name B. And then I see that R is matched up with the name C. I cannot put B here and C here. That would be a terrible mistake. One quantifier, one quantifier means one name. And so it's got to be the same name. Should I use B or should I use C? Well, sometimes it's a good idea to stop and think about it. If I used B, then you can see that after I do double negation, I would, and the ampersand out, I'd be able to use this SB and this conditional and do an arrow out. Well, that seems good. But notice if I chose C, that would give me SC arrow RC, and after the double negation and the ampersand out, or excuse me, no ampersand out, I'd be using the tilde RC, you could do modus tollens. Well, so which is the better choice? It turns out in this case, 
they're both perfectly reasonable choices and that's a problem. So you might just say, well, let me put in something and see what happens. And that would be 7UO. But here's the main point I want to make. A universal is true for everything. So you could put in B, but you could also put in C. And in fact, if you really can't tell which one to choose, it's a very reasonable thing to put in both of them and just use the same justification twice. 13 and 14 are both correct uses of line 7. So let's see. At this point, we've now definitely worked on all of these quantified formulas. We've eliminated all the quantifiers, and it's like we're starting a new proof, and step 6 is to go back and use the propositional rules to finish it off. But again, let me emphasize, turns out that lines 13 and 14, and as well 10 and 11, and all of the things that they came from, all the way back up to 1 and 2, completely extraneous for this proof. When you notice that things are extraneous, you can just leave them alone. Sometimes after you finish the quantified portion of the proof, well, that's where the challenge really starts. But in this particular case, everything is trivial. We now look at line 12. The arrow is the main connective, so we know that we either want to do arrow out or modus tollens. To do arrow out, we would need WA wedge ZA, and we can build that because we have WA. So that's 9 wedge in, and then we can do the arrow out, and since it's a pre-manufactured contradiction, we can just stick it right here. Na ampersand tilde Na, sodium and no sodium, that'd be what, 1215, arrow out. And we are done. Justification for the conclusion on 17 is 5 through 16 tilde out. All right. I hope that was helpful.